votes, budgets, inflation data. Europe has it all next week, and Sarah and Nina are here to discuss it. Sarah, we must start off with the referendum vote in Ukraine this weekend, because that's probably going to overshadow the markets next week. Definitely. The referendum on Sunday is likely to see the citizens of Crimea vote to join um, Russia again. Um, the Ukrainian government, the US and Europe have already said that this referendum is illegal. So if we do see a vote in favor of joining Russia, we could see some sanctions from the US and Europe. And I think this is interesting in several ways. Um, there's been some senior Euro Russian official that expressed concerns about these sanctions, uh, if it could hurt the Russian economy. Yeah. But Putin seems really determined just to keep uh, Crimea under his... Um, yeah, but if there's a sort of tit for tat, that could hurt trade, it could hurt, exactly. hurt investment flows. And the flows. Russian economy has already been a little bit shaky lately, so... We yeah. But some have argued this. in terms of equity markets, at least, that Russian equities have been hammered to a point <laughs> that's so much so they're actually very cheap in terms of emerging market equities. So, yeah. I mean, they're unlikely to get hammered any further, really. Yeah. Okay, so but so it could be a week when that sort of political tension Definitely, really yeah, even if some over. of this is already baked into the markets, I yeah. think Monday we'll yeah. probably see a bit of volatility. We'll see where we lie then. Okay, yeah. let's turn back, though, now to Eurozone inflation data, mm -hmm. the final numbers this week, and that's really the key question for the ECB right now. We're talking so much about this low inflation, deflationary pressures, and the final data for February could be revised down to 0.7%. And of course, this will rekindle this whole discussion. Are we going to see a rate cut at the width from the ECB next month? Are we going to see some other measures? Uh, Draghi was out yesterday, on, on Thursday this week, and talked about how um, the really strong euro has been adding pressure on, defl on, on inflation. So. Um, it will be interesting if he's just sort of got to like, bring out a big new bazooka. But the question is, where was all of this last week at the um, ECB presser that he held? Yes. Financial markets investors, we were all waiting for this commentary on uh, deflationary mm -hmm. risks and on the strong euro, and we didn't really get much around it then. So where was all of that then? OK, Nina, here in the UK, it's the annual budget statement. It's a big parliamentary occasion, mm. but what should investors be looking out for there? Well, there has been some pressure and speculation that there may be some tax cuts mentioned next week uh, right. from, from Osborne. Um, but George Osborne, George he's the Chancellor. Chancellor of the yeah. Exchequer. Yeah. Um, but it seems a, not really sensible at this stage, given that we're in a period of fiscal adjustment and mm. unless there's any real clear uh, budgetary savings uh, savings made elsewhere. It doesn't really seem to make sense at this stage. Plus, and more importantly, we have the general election scheduled for May next year. Yeah. So, the, you know, he may want to save his firepower for then, yeah. it seems. So, I mean, what are you generally expecting? Well, there's been some talk about this output gap that Carney keeps talking about, yes. and um, that we need to get this output gap closed. And he and the Bank of England expect this to happen in two, two to three years, um, but the Chancellor says this will happen maybe in five years. I think the key thing here with the output gap is that when it's closed, the deficit that's left is structural rather than cyclical. So you right. can't just grow your way out of that. So we're, if we meet, if we get this output gap closed in three years rather than five years, um, the politicians will have to figure out how to close this. Okay, a little bit of a technical. Yeah point there but uh, again also on the Bank of England we'll have their latest minutes out next week and some UK jobs data that's right yeah I think for the minutes not really expecting much again okay. no. likely to unanimously have voted to have uh, uh, kept rates mm -hmm. at a record low of half a percent and at uh, but there might be some commentary around the weak weather that we had uh, the poor weather that we had in Feb and and Jan maybe some discussion around that. Well, you definitely be watching it. Um, okay. And then there's, as you said, the UK unemployment data. And yeah. we had that tick up to 7.2% last mm. month. Uh, and we're probably going to see it just remain steady at that level. Okay, fine. Let's, the weekend's coming up. Let's think about the shopping a bit. <laughs> Next week, we'll have Inditex reporting and they own Zara, the big uh, clothing chain. They do. Uh, they have full year results next week. And with this sort of shift to uh, consumer spending on uh, habits online, Inditex has been benefiting from that and capturing that pretty well. Yeah. But its store expansion has been slowing compared to peers like H&M, which have been rapidly expanding, for instance. Right. Um, and also Inditex is quite exposed to emerging markets as well because over okay. the last few years it's been increasing exposure there. So any commentary next week on uh, emerging market and FX related moves will be of interest. But the thing with Inditex is it looks fairly valued uh, at the moment. Okay. So see how that one goes. All right, let's see if we can boost their sales this weekend. Thanks, guys.